know, boat handling is a pretty big subject. So much so that chapters and even whole books have been written about it. We can't even begin to give you the whole story here. We'll try in this film to show the first steps in handling a powerboat and some of the operating characteristics of the LCVP. This LCVP, landing craft for vehicles and personnel, looks as though it's about ready to get underway. But there are a few items which must be checked before this boat can be considered ready for service. Did I say a few? Looks like a half day's work. All boat equipment must be checked. And there are several checks to be made before the engine may be started. Fuel, oil, water, batteries, sand traps, the fuel filter, grease cups, steering apparatus, fuel, oil, and water lines, fuel valves, engine belts, and stuffing boxes. It looks like a lot, yes, but a few minutes' attention by all hands is all that's necessary to take care of it. And every man in the crew must learn to accurately perform every check in the list. The point is this, to be sure, absolutely sure, that all required gear is aboard and that the boat itself is in good operating condition before getting underway. And you don't just take things for granted. See for yourself. That's the rule. While the boat equipment is being carefully examined, the engineer goes ahead with the engine check. And how about the bilges? Excess water in the bottom is lousy seamanship. Makes the boat hard to handle, sluggish in operation. And two, Fuel and oil may collect in dirty bilges, making a serious fire hazard. Here's something to remember. A pump driven by the engine keeps the water down in the bilges, but not if this strainer is fouled. So keep it clean, brother, keep it clean. A moment ago, we mentioned fire hazard. In any power boat, the possibility of fire is always present. So check the fire extinguisher daily, testing its weight to be sure it's full and ready for use. Okay, all gear is aboard and in working condition. Spare oil and water have been provided. The bilges are clean and dry. The engineer is completing the engine check. This is the surge tank, the reservoir for the freshwater cooling system. It must be kept filled to within one inch of the top. And we're ready to start the engine. First, the throttle is turned from the off position to idling position. Remember, Throttle set for idling speed when starting, except when a cold weather start is necessary. As soon as the engine starts, the sand traps are checked for saltwater circulation. The diesel engine in the VP has a freshwater cooling system, capacity about nine gallons. This freshwater is cooled in turn by cold seawater pumped through one of these filters or traps, and then through a heat exchanger. When one trap becomes fouled by sand and bits of shell, the suction current is shifted to the other and the dirty trap is then removed for cleaning. It's absolutely necessary to warm up the engine before the boat is put into operation. This is best done under load condition. That is, with the clutch in gear and the engine turning over between 800 and 1,000 RPMs. If it's not possible to warm up under load, the engine should be run a bit faster, between 1,000 and 1,200 RPMs. In either case, warm-up must be continued until the water temperature gauge registers 130 degrees. Then, and not until then, will the VP be ready for operation. Okay, let's go. Shove off, coxswain. Shifting into gear when getting underway, or shifting from one direction to another, is always done with the throttle set at idling position. And we're finally getting underway. Sure, it took a few minutes, but at least we know that everything is okay. Now for the uninitiated, a short lesson in boat handling. 
The things to be demonstrated apply to almost any single screw, single rudder powerboat. First, use of reverse gear to stop forward motion. The reverse is the brake. Proper use will bring the VP to a complete stop in a reasonably short distance. So much for that. Now, let's get underway again. How about steering a single screw powerboat? Well, steering the LCVP is certainly simple enough, just like the old family car. If you want to go to the right, simply turn the wheel to the right. Yes, it's like a car, all right, but there's a difference that every boat handler must understand. When the wheel is turned, the rudder moves off the center line of the boat. The stern is pushed in the opposite direction. Wheel turned left, rudder moves left and the stern is pushed to the right. Wheel turned right, rudder moves right, and the stern is pushed to the left. Pushing the stern to the left changes the course of the boat to the right. So when you want to change course, remember that the wheel, the rudder, and the bow of the boat all go in the same direction. When you drove that car, you steered with the front wheels, that is, with the bow. And now you're steering with the stern. In a turn like this, the stern describes a larger arc than the bow. The stern is actually being pushed to one side, bringing the bow to a new heading. The turn is stopped by putting the rudder slightly over on the opposite side. The discharge current from the propeller strikes the rudder face, stopping the swing of the stern. Steering while in reverse is much more difficult. The high bow of the VP is a very efficient wind catcher. Even a light breeze will tend to swing the bow so that the stern is headed into the wind, following the path of least resistance. And of course, the discharge screw current no longer strikes the rudder face, so one of the best steering controls is lost. In order to steer a straight course in reverse, the boat handler must watch the bow and correct the slightest tendency to swing immediately. In this way, with careful handling, the boat can be steered on a straight course in reverse. But if the bow is permitted to swing too far, the VP will no longer answer the rudder going astern. It will go into a helpless, waterborne tailspin. And it's next to impossible to bring her out of this swing while backing down. The only thing to do when this happens is to shift into forward gear and use power and rudder to stop the turn and bring the boat to the desired course. Let's go along on a short trip and learn some of the things the crew must watch out for while underway. A constant check must be kept on the engine gauges at all times underway to be sure that pressures and temperatures are maintained within safe operating limits. Oil pressure between 40 and 50 pounds. Oil temperature less than 210 degrees. Water temperature 165 to 175 degrees. Batteries charging between 15 and 30 amps. Right there goes nearly nine tons of solid weight. A collision might mean loss of the boat, serious injuries to personnel, perhaps worse. Responsibility rests with the coxswain. He is responsible for the boat, for the safe, intelligent, seamanlike handling of it, and for carrying out all orders and instructions pertaining to it. He must be alert to size up any situation, decide quickly what is to be done, and to do it smartly. The lookout in the bow must keep a sharp watch for floating objects, which might tear a hole in the bottom or damage the propeller or rudder. When passing other boats, keep to the right if it's possible. And slow down. Slow to bear steerage way when passing close aboard. Keep well clear of boats under sail. If it's necessary to pass close aboard, use slow speed and bear in mind that sailboats have the right of way. Slow speed is also the rule when passing close to a ship at anchor or moored to a buoy, when operating near docks or piers, and when passing a boat or barge flying baker, and at all times when operating in confined or congested areas. An important part of the handling of the LCVP is the correct use of the ramp. So, 
We'll take her into the beach and see how it's done. In action, with the boat crew working as a team, the ramp is lowered and raised very rapidly. For this demonstration, we'll go through the operation very slowly, step by step. The VP is beached at top speed. The ramp is not lowered until the boat is fully grounded. The coxswain stands by the wheel with the engine running and in forward gear. He keeps the boat grounded and by use of power and rudder keeps it head on to the beach. On order from the coxswain, the engineer takes a strain on the ramp cable. The bow man then releases the safety clamps or dogs which prevent the ramp from lowering away accidentally. The engineer disengages the safety pole, still holding the ramp in place by pressure on the ramp crank. He then sets the brake on the cable drum and immediately removes the crank. The crank must not be left on the shaft. The engineer then uses the brake to lower the ramp smartly and steadily to the beach. As soon as it's down, the safety pole is engaged. When the ramp is raised, the stern man assists the engineer. Bend onto it, boys. You can't get off the beach until the ramp is all the way up. The safety pole prevents the accidental release of the ramp while it's being raised. The bow man checks to be sure the safety clamps are properly engaged. The crank is removed from the shaft and secured in its proper place. It took about two minutes to show the operation of the ramp. In action, the whole job is done in a matter of seconds. No waste motion here. As soon as troops and equipment have cleared the boat, the ramp is raised as quickly as possible. This doesn't mean that safety precautions are thrown over the side, but speed is plenty important, and all hands must learn to work fast. As soon as the ramp is all the way up and secured, the coxswain may begin retracting from the beach. In case of engine breakdown, it may be necessary to take the VP in tow, either by towing astern or towing alongside. In the alongside method, the towing boat comes alongside the quarter of the tow. The bow line is passed across and then the stern line. These lines serve as spring or breast lines. The tow line is passed from well forward on the towing boat and secured aft on the tow. This line takes the strain of towing, while bow and stern lines hold the tow in position alongside. The tow line is rigged so as to hold the towing boat well aft on the tow. This method is best when towing for short distances in calm weather. The difference between good boat handling and sloppy boat handling shows up most quickly when coming alongside, whether it's alongside a transport, another boat, a float, or a dock. It is true that experience and experience alone develops the sense of timing necessary in smart boat seamanship. But to study the correct way of doing things speeds the process of learning. And that's why this picture was made. So we'll make that landing again this time with the action slowed to about one-half normal speed. First, the speed of the boat and angle of approach should be such that the boat can be sheared away from alongside without damage in case of engine failure at this point. At about one boat length away from the point of landing, the wheel is put over to bring the boat parallel. By the time the boat is parallel, the rudder should be amidships. The boat is then backed down just hard enough to stop all forward way. If all factors have been correctly judged, the boat comes in to a perfect landing. To get away from alongside, cast off the stern line and hold fast with the bow line. The wheel is put over toward the float, the clutch shifted to forward, slight throttle, and the stern will swing clear. The bow man must slack off the bow line as necessary 
as the stern swings away from the dock so that the line is not parted by too great a strain. This is something every boat handler must remember. As long as the bow is made fast, whether to float or dock, the boat can be controlled and held alongside under almost all conditions by using rudder and power as necessary. The same thing holds true when getting away from alongside. And many practical applications of this rule are found in everyday boat handling. For instance, the boat handler will often be required to maneuver his boat in and out of a confined space. The approach is made very slowly with just enough speed to maintain steerage way. As the bow nears the point of landing, the coxswain shifts to reverse and brings the VP to a stop. The bow man jumps to the dock and takes a turn with his line, standing by to take in or slack off as necessary. The coxswain then shifts to forward, putting the wheel over away from the dock. Using the power of the discharge screw current against the rudder face, the coxswain can swing the stern into place. Getting clear is done in the same way, except that this time the rudder is put over toward the dock in order to swing the stern away from it. With clutch in forward gear, slight throttle will swing the stern away from the dock. The boat can then be backed clear. And that's about it, except for a few things about securing the VP. The first of these is to be sure that lines are made fast properly when tying up. When securing to a bollard, which may be nothing more than a convenient piling, first take one or two round turns, then make two half hitches. If securing to a cleat, pass the line around the cleat, making a three-quarter round turn. Then lay a series of figure eights over the cleat. Do not use half hitches. The weight of the boat against the line may freeze a half hitch, making it difficult, sometimes impossible, to free the line. Before the crew leaves the boat, all gear must be properly stowed. Boat and engine must be clean and ship -shaped. Water and oil supply must be checked and containers refilled if necessary. The engine must be cooled before it's shut down. This is done by running it for a few minutes at 800 RPMs. Now here's a word for all of you. Every man in the crew must be a competent boat handler. You'll get plenty of practice and experience. Make the most of it. And if training seems dull, full of detail, a lot of little things, remember this. It's the ability to do all the little things and do them right that makes good boat crews. And without good boat crews, we can't put the stuff ashore to do the job we know we've got to do. Just keep that in mind, will you?